Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on secondary infertility. I am Dr. Alex Polyakov, and I'm one of the fertility specialists with Melbourne IVF. And uh, I am also an obstetrician and gynecologist in private practice, as well as in a large metropolitan hospital at the Royal Women's Hospital uh, in Melbourne. And we are now in lockdown. So those of you who are joining us from outside of Victoria, enjoy your freedom. Uh, this format is a little bit different. We decided to do a presentation through the Zoom. So hopefully you can all see my screen. And I thought what we might do is I'll do a quick talk, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then you can post your questions as I go. And at the end, I'll try to get through them all. I hope that works for everyone. So let us start. Secondary infertility has been in the news lately, and I was actually interviewed for this particular article. It appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald. Amy Schumer, who is a famous actress, apparently came out on Facebook and Instagram to say that she has secondary infertility. And so, first of all, we need to talk about the difference between primary and secondary infertility. And of course, primary infertility implies that you have never had a child or never had a pregnancy, while secondary infertility usually indicates that you already have one or more children and there is difficulty conceiving for the second or third or subsequent time. And so the difference is that, first of all, as women get older, it often is more difficult to get pregnant. And it applies to both primary and secondary infertility. So it might be easy to get pregnant in your 20s and 30s, but once you reach your mid-30s, late 30s, early 40s, it becomes more difficult. And that is because the best eggs, the best oocytes are actually used up when you're younger. And so as women get older, the quality and the number of eggs that remains is, is getting worse and worse and worse. And at some point women run out of eggs and that's when menopause starts and periods stop and there is no possibility of getting pregnant after that. And so because we're talking about primary, uh, secondary infertility rather, uh, women are generally older because they already had a child, had a break, recovered and decided to have another one. So those women who are trying for a second child are usually older than the ones who are trying for the first. And it also applies to men. It is not as crucial in men because men can have biological children well in the 80s and 90s, but nevertheless, the chances of pregnancy are somewhat dependent on the age of men. Weight is another issue, and it's unfortunately a well-known fact that as women age, some would gain weight. And so that's an additional problem in secondary infertility, as we would see more women who are overweight. And people often dismiss this as a non-issue, but weight plays a crucial role. If, if, if you're overweight, and if you're significantly overweight, especially, the chance of pregnancy is reduced by order of 20 to 30 percent. And so when we say that it's ideal to be at your best in terms of weight when you're trying to conceive, uh, it actually makes a huge difference. There is no intervention that helps as much as getting to a normal BMI. Of course, smoking, alcohol, and substance abuse play a role. And if you smoke, and it's true for secondary as well as primary infertility, uh, if you smoke, if you drink a lot of alcohol, if you use various recreational drugs, such as cocaine, the chance of pregnancy is less, but also the risk of miscarriage is increased. Medical conditions and secondary infertility, because women are older, more of them develop various medical problems, including diabetes, heart disease, and uh, hypertension or high blood pressure. And more women are taking medications for those conditions, which may 
in fact interfere with the chance of them getting pregnant. So as women get older, that becomes more common. Previous obstetric history is very important. If the pregnancy progressed well and you had a normal delivery, that's, that's usually you know, a good thing. It is well known that if you had a cesarean, especially an emergency cesarean, the chance of infertility is higher later on. So that is something to keep in mind. And of course, every birth has its own risks and complications, and there could be some long lasting damage. For example, if the placenta is retained and you require manual removal of placenta or curette afterwards, that may in fact damage the uterine cavity and falling pregnant for the second time or the third time may be quite difficult. The good news in all this, that in, in this field, people who already had a successful pregnancy are generally more likely to have another one compared to someone of the same age who's never been pregnant. And so there is some evidence to suggest that women who are treated for secondary infertility have more success getting pregnant compared to those who've never been pregnant. And so I'll talk a little bit generally about fertility, and this applies to both primary and secondary infertility. There is really no major difference as to how, how this, this works. Uh, about one in six couples would require assistance to get pregnant in general. And we divide issues into sort of female-related, male-related, but a lot of couples present with a combination. So there could be something uh, in, in the woman that, that decreases her chances of pregnancy as well as the man. And there is a small proportion, probably at the moment about 20% of couples where we do all the appropriate investigations and we look at all the parameters and they're all normal. And those couples would be classified as unexplained infertility. For females, for, for women, the most important factor that determines whether they'll have a child or not is really their age. And that's where secondary infertility comes into play because generally women are a little bit older when they come to, to see us. And there are other things that could make it problematic, for example, blocked or damaged fallopian tubes. And that could be the result of some sort of sexually transmitted infection or general pelvic infection. But in fact, the tubes can be damaged during delivery, especially, as I said, difficult emergency cesarean section that could be damaged to the uterus or the tubes. Another factor that is quite common is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, this particular condition is, in fact, less common in older women because as women get older, most of them sort of grow out of it to an extent. But it's a condition characterized by anovulation. So women don't have regular periods. And in fact, their periods are quite infrequent and irregular. And that implies that they don't regularly ovulate. And so they don't release an egg, which cannot be fertilized. And therefore, they find it difficult to get pregnant. Another very common condition is endometriosis, probably affects between 10 and 20% of women to some extent. And usually, it presents with painful periods. But occasionally we find, especially in the group with unexplained infertility, women would have no symptoms and then further investigations reveals presence of endometriosis, which is important because not only does it decrease the chance of spontaneous or natural pregnancy, it also decreases the chances of pregnancy with IVF. And so it's important to investigate and it's important to treat endometriosis if it's found because if this particular woman goes on to have IVF and endometriosis is treated, her chances of pregnancy are higher compared to someone who hasn't been investigated, hasn't been treated, and the endometriosis is still there. Another condition is fibroids. Those are benign tumors of the uterus, and they arise from the muscle of, of the uterine wall, and they're extremely common. So most women would, would have 
some. Some of them are really small, some of them are quite big, some women have lots and some women have one or two. And occasionally they cause problems. Usually they don't cause any problems, but the classical presentation is heavy periods and then ultrasound is ordered and fibroid is found. For the fertility aspect of, of fibroids, it is important what the size is, but also where they are in relation to the uterine cavity. So if they are growing into the uterine cavity, falling pregnant may be difficult and the risk of miscarriage is increased. If they are away from the cavity, even though they might be quite big, five, six, seven centimeters, they may not be as important for conception. And of course, failure of ovulation, usually related to polycystic ovarian syndrome, but there are other conditions like thyroid dysfunction or high prolactin level, which may in fact cause absence of ovulation. And so an egg is not released to be fertilized and that conception would be quite difficult. Diet is very important. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there are lots of nutrients and minerals that are essential. And I would advise all women who are trying to get pregnant to take at least a multivitamin specifically designed for pregnancy, but also to have a well-balanced recommended diet. So if you look at what things you can do to, to improve your chances, uh, coffee is a, you know, it's an interesting topic whether drinking coffee makes any difference. My personal opinion is that perhaps a cup a day would not make much difference. Uh, if you drink excessive amounts and the recommended dose is about 200 milligrams, which is about two cups of instant coffee, uh, you should cut down. And I would say that if you drink more than that, you should probably cut down to less than two or even one cup of coffee a day. Alcohol is a no-no, of course, especially in large amounts. But I don't think it matters if on Saturday night you have a glass of champagne or a glass of wine every day or second day. That wouldn't matter. Uh, but excessive drinking certainly decreases your chances of conception. Healthy diet and exercise, they often come together. And of course, if you have healthy diet and you exercise, your BMI should be within normal range. And that is something that I, I feel strongly about. I think that weight loss as treatment for infertility is, is grossly underutilized. A lot, a lot of women are overweight and that could be the main reason why they find it difficult to fall pregnant. And of course, smoking is, is not something that I would recommend. And in fact, it's very detrimental to, to your chance of, of conception. And so if you smoke, you should quit. So the definition, what is infertility? Essentially, it is defined as not being able to fall pregnant after 12 months of trying regularly, trying regularly. So every month you try to have sex at least around the time of ovulation. And if you do that for 12 months and you have regular periods and everything else is fine and you're not able to get pregnant, you should come and see one of us, one of the fertility specialists. For older women, for example, someone who is over 38, I would probably suggest that six months of trying is sufficient to think about having a conversation or a consultation with a fertility specialist because time is really not on your side. As I mentioned before, age is the most important predictor of success for falling pregnant naturally, but also for success with fertility treatments. And so the first consultation with a fertility specialist would include review of medical and fertility history. So there's a bit of a discussion going on as to you know, how long you've been trying, what your periods are like, whether you had any medical problems in the past, whether you take any medications, whether there are any, any aspects of your history that would be pointing towards the reason for infertility. Assessment of general health, is, is also important and we organize fertility tests. So that usually includes a whole lot of blood tests and we always do 
what's called pre-pregnancy screening blood tests, which involve blood count, hepatitis, syphilis antibodies, all those infections that may be important in pregnancy. We would also look at the hormone levels, ovarian hormones, reproductive hormones, as well as thyroid function. We would check ovarian reserve, and we do this with the test called anti-malarian hormone, which is quite accurate. And it essentially tells us how many eggs are left. It does not predict the chance of success naturally, but from a fertility specialist point of view, it is important to know that value because that tells us if in the future you need fertility treatment, what kind of fertility treatment to offer. And we also organize an ultrasound to look for things like endometriosis, adhesions, ovarian cysts, fibroids, endometrial polyps. There are a lot of things that could be abnormal, which need to be corrected before you can get pregnant. And ultrasound is very important in that regard because that's the only investigation that would tell us what, what surgical interventions could be done to improve your chances. And of course, we order a semen analysis for the men. And so these are the, the things that we do. And as you may know, at puberty, there are about 400,000 eggs and 20 or so are recruited in every cycle, in a natural cycle, but only one of those progresses to be the dominant follicle or dominant egg, which is released and available for fertilization. And all the others sort of die off in that particular cycle. And then in the next cycle, a new batch is recruited. Now, there is a common misconception that if you do IVF and you collect, let's say, 20 eggs, that somehow reduces your number of eggs that are available. That simply isn't true. What we do with IVF is that we rescue the eggs that were recruited for this particular cycle. They don't disappear. They don't go away, but instead we collect them. And so those eggs that we collect wouldn't have progressed to anything. And in the next cycle, there'll be another batch. And so by doing IVF, you certainly don't decrease the total number of eggs that you have. Now, semen analysis is an interesting test. This, this is one of my favorite slides. This is from the 50s, I believe, uh, somewhere in the United States, a number of prisoners or inmates were asked to provide sperm on the every second day. And this is the graph of one of them, and they did it for two years, maybe a bit more. Uh, every couple of days, they provided a sperm sample. And as you can see, the graph is not a straight line. So on some days, the sperm count of how many sperm there is was really, really high. And then on some days, it was really, really low. And so what it tells us is that even if the semen analysis initially is abnormal, it doesn't mean that it's always abnormal. And therefore we don't diagnose problems with sperm based on one single semen analysis. We always request a repeat test in six weeks to see if it's consistently abnormal. Because in, in some men who have abnormal semen analysis, the second semen analysis is completely fine. And then we would have to say that that's not a problem, that was just a bad week. That, that the first analysis was done in. And there are a number of abnormalities that are common. First of all, we look at the number of sperm and we look at how well they're moving, whether they're moving forward or in circles, and we look at what they look like. And as you can see on these pictures, some sperm look normal. So it's a classic picture of a sperm with a head and a tail. And some of them look really, really abnormal. Some of them have no tails, some of them have broken tails, some of them have two heads. Now, for the semen analysis to be normal, all those parameters, the count, the movement, and what they look like, they all need to be within normal range. And normal range is defined as something that was done uh, to look at people who are conceiving normally. And so if one of those parameters is really drastically off, the chance of spontaneous conception or pregnancy naturally is, is actually quite small. 
and uh, so there are special techniques that are available as long as some sperm is available it's generally possible to conceive but if the seminalysis is really grossly abnormal you may not be able to conceive without help and so that's something to keep in mind now once all these tests come back we have another meeting with the patient we talk about the results and if there is something that is abnormal that can be fixed for example if there is a fibroid if there is a polyp if there is endometriosis there are surgeries available to treat that if the seminalysis is abnormal we would ask for a repeat thyroid function may be abnormal and you may need some medication to make it normal if polycystic ovarian syndrome is diagnosed there are various treatment options available so the second consultation is usually to talk about the results and what the problem is if it's possible to determine from these tests and what the next step would be and there are simple treatments and there are more involved treatments and people often think that what fertility specialists do is only IVF that's really not true I mean there is a lot of IVF that we do but there are other treatments available that would help couples to conceive and they first of all involve fixing the problem that might be identified by doing the tests so that's the first step and then there is what's called cycle monitoring so we would say let's monitor your cycle let's see when you ovulate let's do an ultrasound somewhere mid-cycle to determine what the best time for sex is there is also ovulation induction so women who don't ovulate for whatever reason be it polycystic ovarian syndrome or some other abnormality there are tablets that we can give to bring ovulation on and there are also injections to achieve the same goal intrauterine insemination is another treatment that is less invasive and less involved than IVF and it's used for unexplained infertility and endometriosis it's sort of similar to natural conception except the sperm ends up in the uterus rather than the vagina and also it gets cleaned up and concentrated in the lab before being put there and so the chance of pregnancy certainly increased compared to just doing natural you know conception and then there is IVF and there are two different approaches and which one is selected depends mostly on the semen parameters so if the sperm is completely normal then we would do what's called in vitro fertilization and that is just collecting sperm collecting eggs and putting them together to fertilize themselves if the semen analysis is abnormal we would do what's called intracytoplasmic sperm injection where we select the best looking sperm and it gets placed inside the egg to achieve fertilization and so this is the process of IVF as you can see there is orientation you spend some time with the counselors the nurses tell you how it all will work and the logistics day to day and then your prescribed hormone injections which you take at home by yourself every day there is monitoring with ultrasound for which you come to see your fertility specialist and then about 10 days later there is egg collection where you go to sleep and we collect eggs through transvaginal approach with an ultrasound the eggs and the sperm then go to the lab and embryo is created and it is i'll come back to this one in a second so this is what happens when the embryo is created so fertilization is day one and we check whether the embryo is fertilized normally or not and then it gets cultured on to day five and the aim is for an embryo to achieve a blastocyst stage and that is the stage at which it will implant and on day five after egg collection that's when the embryo usually gets transferred now this this slide is very important i always feel that it's very important to have realistic expectations of of the cycle and if you look at that amy schumer article in the sydney morning herald she was talking about the fact that she had you know something like 30 eggs collected and you know 20 of them became embryos on day one but only one of them made it on day five and was able to be transferred and this is not uncommon we often collect quite a good number of eggs if the ovarian reserve is good and some of those eggs are mature and some of those eggs are not 
and some of those mature eggs will fertilize and some of them will not and some of them will progress to be good embryos on day five and some of them will not and so if you have let's say 10 eggs you can expect two to four embryos at the end of the process we usually transfer one uh, because we're trying to avoid making twins and we freeze all the others that are of good quality for future use so if you don't get pregnant in the first cycle you can come back and use frozen embryos and you don't have to go through egg collection again and so one of the things that we provide at melbourne avf is is we feel that it's best to get someone pregnant sooner rather than later and that depends on how well we can select the best eggs the best sperm and on day five, the best embryo. And there are various techniques that we use. One of them is called embryoscope, where embryos are cultured on in an incubator, which takes pictures of them every 10 minutes or so. And then we have a movie of, of the development of the embryo. We also are now beginning to employ artificial intelligence to actually tell us which embryos have the best potential to become a baby. And all those techniques combined should provide for the best chance for pregnancy, but also to get you pregnant sooner with the first embryo, second rather than the third and the fourth. So that's, that's our aim. And this is embryo transfer. So it's really quite simple. It's like having a pap smear. So embryo is placed inside the uterine cavity and then you wait for 10 days to have a pregnancy test. As I mentioned, excess embryos are stored in liquid nitrogen so they're frozen they're biologically inactive and they can be stored essentially indefinitely but in victoria there is a legislative limit we can only store them for up to 10 years uh, but most women would come back well before that time there is also something i wanted to mention and it's sort of unrelated to infertility but it's secondary infertility it may be of some value the technique of social egg freezing or egg freezing for no medical indications. So as I mentioned, women, as they get older, the chances of spontaneous pregnancy, as well as pregnancy with IVF decreases. And one of the things that is now available is that if, if you are thinking of having another child, but not for a year or two or three, you may want to consider freezing your eggs because eggs frozen at the age of 35 are uh, much better and have a much higher chance of producing a baby compared to doing IVF at the age of 42. So that's just something to mention in passing. And now I will try to get out of this. And there are quite a few questions and I'll do my best to answer them all. Now, the first question is, how long after a cesarean section can you start IVF again? Is there an advisable wait time? Uh, yes, it's not based on very strong evidence, but the advice generally is that if you had a cesarean section, you, can, you should wait at least six months before commencing further fertility treatment. Most people would recommend at least a year, but after a year, the, the uterus and the scar on the uterus is healed enough and has enough strength to, to be able to carry another pregnancy. So I would say 12 months. I mean, most people are, you know, most people easily wait that long after the birth of their first child because it's it's quite difficult. I can tell you from personal experience that you wouldn't want two babies, you know, under three at the same time. But uh, generally speaking, six to 12 months wait is usually sufficient. The second question is, husband had radiotherapy and my tests are normal. What are our chances of having a baby with IVF treatment? Now, this is a tricky one because it depends on a number of factors. First of all, before radio came, radiotherapy and chemotherapy for men 
most men are encouraged to store their sperm before treatment because obviously radiotherapy especially around the pelvic region would damage the sperm and so if the sperm was frozen before treatment was done and you are generally well uh, your chances are good but your chances mostly depend on the woman's age and so if you are 32 let's say and there is good quality of sperm frozen and there is quite a bit of it frozen your chances are excellent i would say if you persevere more than 90 percent on the other hand if you are in your 40s especially mid 40s the chances are not great and your chance of success or giving birth per embryo transfer drops down to 10 percent and later on even less than five percent so it depends on a number of factors if the sperm is healthy and it's available even if it's frozen and you're young and you have good ovarian reserve and no other medical issues chances are excellent on the other hand if you're older if there is no sperm frozen and radiotherapy was done then the chances might not be as good there are, there are a lot of aspects to this question which is you know it's a little bit tricky to give advice over over facebook but you know you should probably see a fertility specialist to discuss your chances further because they would be able to put everything together and give you sensible numbers what helps embryos stick uh it's it's a tricky question i mean we used to do transfers on day two so we would culture embryos we would collect eggs collect sperm fertilize them and then transfer two days later we we found out in the last few years that that's probably not the best approach we now transfer only day five embryos uh 99 of the time that is the time that embryo actually implants that's the time when embryos typically attach themselves to the uterine wall to the endometrium and so that helps embryos stick we also use what's called embryo glue routinely and it's not really a glue it doesn't actually glue embryos to the uterus uh, but what it does it provides nourishment for the embryos while they're being cultured and just before the embryo transfer and so that may well be helpful um, it's a tricky question even with embryos that are genetically normal even the ones that are tested for genetic abnormalities and are found to be genetically normal the chance of pregnancy is probably about 60 percent so there is 40 percent of embryos even genetically normal ones that do not produce a pregnancy the factors that improve your chances are having normal uterus normal cavity no polyps no endometriosis no fibroids so all those things need to be assessed and treated if needed before you have an embryo transfer also the thickness of the lining of the endometrium is important and when we do cycles with frozen embryos we pay particular attention to the thickness of the lining because if it's really thin the chance of implantation may be less uh, but there is no magic trick to it i mean the only things as i said you have to have good diet avoid smoking avoid alcohol you know good bmi all those things are really very important for the embryos to have a higher chance to implant and to produce a viable pregnancy the next question is is there anything a male partner can do to help conceiving uh, all those things that i just mentioned good diet exercise avoiding smoking avoiding anabolic steroids having good weight are important better quality sperm makes your chances of success higher and if it can be optimized in some people it can't be in some people the sperm is is of poor quality but there are things that you can do as a man to to improve things losing weight exercising having sensible diet taking multivitamins there is a multivitamin on the market which is you know supposed to improve quality of sperm it's called menavit and i usually recommend it to my patients because it contains a lot of antioxidants and it may in fact improve the quality of sperm better sperm means 
better chance of pregnancy. It's as simple as that. Uh, the next question is, if you have a higher BMI, do you require higher dose of IVF drugs to get a good response? Uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, a lot of women with higher BMI also have some degree of polycystic ovarian syndrome and they have more eggs and their response is usually higher. So you have to balance those two. Generally speaking, it the dose of medication depends more on your age and your ovarian reserve as measured by AMH levels rather than the BMI. There are protocols, for example, there is one drug, Recavel, that we use for ovarian stimulation as an IVF drug that has a protocol based on someone's weight, not so much BMI, but weight and AMH level. So there are various protocols, but generally speaking, the answer is no. There are three or four standard levels of, of drug stimulation that we use, all of us. And the decision is really made based on age and ovarian reserve rather than BMI in for, for, for those women. So I hope I hope that makes sense. And also it, it's important to remember that you don't want to get too many eggs. Firstly, because uh, the quality may not be as good. Secondly, because there is a condition called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, if you get hyperstimulated, you really get quite unwell. And if you get pregnant on that cycle, it gets much worse. And so in, in women with higher BMI, the chance of overstimulation is a little bit higher. Uh, wondering what causes sperm to die in the service in the cervix is this a sign of infertility i mean there there was in the sort of what my daughter calls olden days we used to do a test called cervical penetration test where we would collect sperm from the cervix after sex and look at it under the microscope and see how whether it penetrates the cervix uh that test hasn't been done for a while it's not something that we generally do i mean women who have this problem if it's indeed a problem may may need to have IVF to bypass that problem. It's, it's more to do with the cervix being inhospitable to sperm and the sperm would find it difficult to get through it. Uh, those patients these days would be classified, if everything else is normal, would be classified as um, um, unexplained infertility and would probably end up having IVF, which would bypass this problem. It's, it's difficult to say. I don't know anyone these days who does that test, but perhaps some of the older clinicians would. And so I don't know how you would determine whether sperm died in the cervix. I don't, I don't know how you do that, apart from doing what I just described. Um, so I'm just trying to look. Uh, hi, Dr. Polyakov. What does aneuploidy have to do with a successful pregnancy? So, uh, genetically, a lot of embryos are genetically abnormal. So they could have extra chromosomes or missing chromosomes or bits of chromosomes in the wrong place. And that's what's called aneuploid embryo. It means genetically abnormal. There are the opposite, the embryos that are genetically normal, and they're called euploid. And the only way to know this is to do the test called PGS, which is pre-implantation genetic screening. So an embryo is biopsied, a little bit of embryo is taken on day five and analyzed genetically to see if it is genetically normal or not. And so the idea here is that embryos that are not genetically normal or unemployed would not have a chance of producing a baby. They may produce a pregnancy, which would miscarry, and sometimes they would produce a genetic abnormality like Down syndrome babies. So those embryos that produce Down syndrome babies, they're 
unemployed. They have extra chromosome 21. And there are a number of conditions like this. And so generally speaking, you would have to say that to have a successful pregnancy and a child to be born, the embryo needs to be euploid, which is essentially means genetically normal. So that's what it means. And the bigger the abnormality in the embryo, the less likely it's even to implant. So embryos with major, major abnormalities like five or six chromosomes missing or added, they would not even progress beyond the blastocyst stage and therefore they would not implant. They simply wouldn't produce a pregnancy of any kind. But the ones that would imply, um, the ones that would implant that are unemployed, most of them would result in early miscarriage. Uh, but not all. Some of them can progress a bit further. Uh, now, let me just scroll down. There are quite a few questions. I have seven years old child and we're trying for seven to eight months for second one, but no luck. Why is that? Uh, well, I think I, I just explained there are a lot of reasons why this could be the case. And I think the next step for you would be to make an appointment with a fertility specialist with your husband together to go through the process that I've just described to, to have everything looked at, to have all the tests, to see if there is an identifiable problem. I, I think that would be the next step. It's very difficult to say why you can't get pregnant uh, for the second time without doing all those investigations that I mentioned just in my talk. Uh, multiple chemical pregnancies from multiple ICSI cycles using donor sperm. Is it likely an egg quality issue, age 37? It's a very difficult question to answer, I'm afraid. Um, at, at the age 37, let's just say, if, if you are well and your ovarian reserve is good and there are no major problems like polyps or fibroids or endometriosis or whatever else, uh, your chance of pregnancy is certainly somewhere in the order of 30-35%. But your chance of having a child from that pregnancy is a little bit less. And so some pregnancies progress to a certain point and then stop and end up in miscarriage. And that's usually due to unemployed, due to genetic problems with, with the embryo itself and so there are options available to look at genetic component of the embryos that are produced unfortunately we don't have any way of assessing the quality of eggs there is not it's not something that can be done all we can say is that we are getting a good number of eggs we are they look normal you don't know whether they are great eggs or poor quality eggs if they look normal they're normal if they fertilize and produce embryos that tells us that they're reasonable quality and so it depends on first of all how many chemical pregnancies you've had there are also extra tests that could be done and usually done if you have multiple early miscarriages and they may involve looking at autoimmune diseases, at even natural killer cells very occasionally. There are a lot of other tests, but it becomes a little bit specialized and a little bit beyond what we're talking here. Uh, what you can do to improve the quality of eggs is, you know, as I mentioned, healthy lifestyle, healthy BMI, having multivitamins. Also, there is some evidence to suggest that taking antioxidants such as CoQ10 may improve the quality of eggs. And so the best advice I can give you is to talk to your fertility specialist to see what other tests may be appropriate under the circumstances. Once again, it's difficult to give personal advice over, over Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and I would recommend talking to your fertility specialist about what other tests may be required or available to address this issue. Uh, 
there is a question on how to improve soft eggs. I, I, I haven't heard that, that definition before. Usually eggs are surrounded by uh, cells that support them. I'm not quite sure what soft eggs mean exactly. Uh, some eggs we find are actually quite hard. It's actually difficult to get sperm into them. And if you just leave sperm and egg together to do their own thing, most of those eggs don't fertilize. So it's, I, I am not quite clear what the question is on soft eggs, uh, but it may have something to do with the quality and all the women have poorer quality. Uh, and as I mentioned in the, in the last question, it's, it's tricky without knowing exactly what's going on, without talking to the embryologists to say what they actually mean by soft eggs. It's not, it's not a well sort of accepted thing. I, I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, but once again, the advice, as always, is to talk to your fertility specialist to see if further testing may be required for, for the particular problem that you might have after the first or second or third cycle. Uh, next question is, I just had to retest my embryos out of two, one died. Does the other have even a chance with all the freezing and unfreezing? I got 33 eggs and 16 fertilized on two day six and one day five, uh, but was abnormal. Uh, what can I do to make me feel like doing it again? Now, once again, difficult to give advice. The first stop would be to have a discussion with your fertility specialist to see whether a slightly perhaps mild stimulation with perhaps less eggs may be appropriate. Also to see if genetic testing of embryos is appropriate if you have such small number. It's, it's a very controversial topic, which, which, you know, a talk in itself about whether genetic testing of embryos is for everyone or whether it should be done in very selected cases or whether it should be done at all. And so I think if you produce 33 eggs and 16 of them fertilize, this is a very, very good result. Obviously it's not the end result that you want, but nevertheless, I think there is hope that you know, it's a little bit of a numbers game. If you were to have another cycle and 14 of them fertilized, it's possible that, you know, maybe 10 or seven make it to day five and are good quality embryos. The question is whether it's worth testing them for genetic abnormalities. And that is something a bit controversial. And we don't really know the answer to that question. And so depending on age, on your age, the number of normal or genetically normal embryos would certainly be higher if you're younger and lower if you're older. Uh, I would I would discuss those aspects of your treatment with your with your fertility specialist because once again it is really quite impossible for me to say yes you should do this or yes you should do that. I think your chances are better than most because you produce so many eggs and so many of them become embryos, and so it's a question of what happens after and hopefully they progress and you know, become good embryos on day five or six and can be used and can be frozen at some point. So I hope, I hope that helps, but all I can say is speak with your fertility specialist and you know, discuss what other treatments or options are available to address these, these issues where only so few of them make it to day five. Can mild adenomyosis affect fertility? Uh, adenomyosis is a similar condition. In fact, they often come together as endometriosis. But adenomyosis is the growth of endometrial glands into the muscle. So it grows sort of into the uterus. Endometriosis, of course, is the growth of lining of the uterus outside of the uterus. So they're slightly different, but often we see them together. I do not believe that mild adenomyosis has any effect on, on fertility. Unfortunately, 
there is absolutely no treatment for adenoma for mild adenomyosis. There is no surgical intervention that can correct it. And so even if it does have some impact, which I don't believe it does, but even if it does, there is not much you can do about it. All you can do is try naturally. And if you get pregnant within six months to a year, adenomyosis should not make it more difficult for you to have the pregnancy. If you don't get pregnant, then seeing a fertility specialist would be the next step. The only thing I would like to mention is that if you have adenomyosis on ultrasound, your chance of having endometriosis as well is higher. And I would probably encourage you to, to mention that to your fertility specialist when the time comes, uh, because there may be a need to investigate the possibility of endometriosis being present as well. And treatment of endometriosis is not only is it available, but it is also very helpful for fertility. Uh, can you conceive by IVF when your body is autoimmune? I, 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 you know, autoimmune diseases are very common and they have lots and lots of manifestations. It could be related to thyroid dysfunction. It could be related to things like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or various other things. All those conditions may be related to fertility in some way but it is a very, very specialized area. It's not something that can be sort of put all together as one disease. There are a multitude of diseases that are autoimmune disease. Even uh, multiple sclerosis is, is an autoimmune disease. So there is a variety of diseases which are considered to be autoimmune, but that needs specialized input. Most women with autoimmune condition can absolutely get pregnant and have a child. There is no question in my mind, but it requires really quite specialized treatment with a fertility specialist who is, uh, whose interest it is to, to deal with autoimmune conditions. And depending on what it is, they may need input from other specialists like rheumatologists or the like to actually work out what the best options are to, to achieve pregnancy. So it's, there is no simple answer. Most people who have autoimmune condition for sure can get pregnant and have a successful pregnancy, but their management is highly specialized and need a fertility specialist with interest in that area. Uh, would you recommend to get embryos genetically tested before transfer? As I mentioned before, this is an area that is that is quite controversial. There are aspects of genetic testing that may in fact reduce your overall chance of pregnancy. For example, embryo needs to be biopsied. So what that does, you take an embryo and you take a small piece of it from the embryo and you send it for analysis. Now, not all embryos survive that. Some of them don't. And some of those embryos that don't survive the actual biopsy may in fact produce normal children. There is also a little bit of a controversy as to whether the testing is 100% accurate. There, are, there is a paper that came out recently that seems to show that the testing as it is done now is extremely accurate. And so it, it picks up all the abnormal ones and it selects the ones that are normal. Uh, but in the past, it wasn't the case. Also, if you have genetic testing, the embryos must be biopsied and frozen. So you probably wouldn't have a fresh transfer. And from our own research, we know that certainly in our center, fresh embryos do a little bit better. So you're better off doing a fresh transfer than freezing all the embryos. And so you have to also keep in mind that Genetic testing of the embryos doesn't change the embryos. They are what they are. All it does, it selects the embryos that may be of higher potential to produce a pregnancy. And so what that technique would do most of the time is shorten the time from trying to conceive to actually getting pregnant with IVF. But also you have to remember that Genetic abnormalities are less common in women who are younger, right? And those women 
also have lots of embryos, but those embryos are less likely to be abnormal. But if you have someone who is 43 and they produce just one or two embryos, the risk of damage, in my opinion, is probably a little bit unacceptable. So if that embryo, the one embryo that you might have that looks good is damaged and is not transferred, the chance of pregnancy is zero. But if it's transferred, whether you know it's abnormal or not, there is a chance. And so my feeling is that it's a very individualized sort of decision. You really have to discuss it at length with your fertility specialist. And, and have, have this discussion, whether it's worth it for you in your circumstances. For some people it is, and for some people it's not. It's a very individualized decision. Uh, I have an embryo frozen which has been tested with an A-grade result. We are going through surrogacy. How well will the embryo take? My surrogate is a very healthy woman. Uh, this is a difficult question to answer. Generally speaking, the chance of pregnancy depends mostly on the age of the person who produced an egg. If the embryo was genetically tested, and it's genetically normal, and your surrogate is healthy, the chance of successful pregnancy is somewhere between 50 and 70%. I'm not quite clear from your question whether the embryo was genetically tested or whether it was just looked at and it looks great. And that's what we call 5AA embryos or 4AA embryos. And then if it hasn't been genetically tested, then your age comes into play here. And if you're young, the chances are very good. And if you're older, the chances are less. So that's, that's once again, a conversation with your fertility specialist to, to give you a general idea of how successful or otherwise this, this transfer will be. I think we have the last question. Uh, I'm sure there are more, but I'm losing my voice. <laughs> So I do apologize. Thoughts on assisted hatching if embryos aren't implanting? And how much importance do you put on embryo grading? Uh, now, assisted hatching is another sort of funny technique where they break the shell of the embryo to make it come out from its shell a bit better. Uh, my personal opinion is that it doesn't really help for the embryo to implant. Uh, it may damage the embryo, just like any other manipulation that it does. Uh, there is not a lot of evidence for assisted hatching to be helpful in, in implantation. I, I don't believe there is strong, robust evidence to say assisted hatching is great. I don't think there is that. Uh, some programs do it routinely, some do it very selectively. Uh, overall, the jury is still out. I wouldn't recommend it as a general technique. I would once again speak with your fertility specialist and they would probably speak with their embryologist to see if in their lab, this is something that has been shown to be more successful than not. Overall, the research, I think is pretty clear, it doesn't really help that much. But once again, we're trying to do what's called individualized medicine. So everybody is a bit different for some people in some circumstances, perhaps it would be helpful. And the second question was how much importance do you put on embryo grading? Uh, well, embryo grading, once again, it doesn't change the embryo. All it does, it tells you what the chance of this embryo implanting and producing a baby is. It doesn't tell you anything else. The grading that we use is called Gardner grading. Uh, just a side note, David Gardner, who invented it a few decades ago, is our chief embryologist. He's in charge of our embryology labs. So this is the guy who invented grading. He is the guy who runs our IVF labs. So that's that's pretty good, I think. Uh, and we're, we're very, very proud to have him with us. 
at the end of the day, the way I look at it, you have an embryo, it could be great embryo or great looking embryo, or it could be less good looking embryo because grading is, that's what it is. It's how it looks. At the end of the day, what we do is we, let's say we have five embryos of different grades. We put in embryos that are the best grade embryos first because we want pregnancy to happen sooner rather than later. And so you go through those embryos one by one from the best looking to the worst looking. At the end of the day, the outcome is either positive or negative. The way I look at it, does it really matter what kind of grade it is? Does it matter from a, you know, from a patient's point of view, whether you have a 30% pregnancy chance or a 20%? Does that, I, I hope I'm making sense. I, I, I don't think that I would say, look, this embryo is, you know, BB, for example. It's not that great, I'm not going to put it in. Of course, we're going to put it in because the chance of that embryo taking is about 20%. Sure, we would prefer for that embryo to be 5AA, where the chance of pregnancy would be above 50%. But at the end of the day, we only have embryos of certain grade we can't make them better we have done everything we can in the lab to make them as good as they can be and so all it tells you is what the potential of the embryo is even the best looking embryo is not guaranteed to actually produce a baby and even the worst looking embryo has zero chance if it's transferred i i hope i'm making sense so it's important for our own data collection and quality controls and to, to provide further information to patients how likely or unlikely they are to get pregnant with a particular embryo. But at the end of the day, we're using the best embryo that is available. And if we use it, there is a reasonable chance for that embryo to produce a pregnancy because the ones that are really poor quality they don't get used, they get discarded because the chance of pregnancy is so small that it's really not worth putting it in. I, I, I hope that makes sense. It's important, but at the end of the day, that's all you have. You don't have a better embryo to transfer. It's not a choice between putting in a better embryo or a worse embryo. Of course, you're going to put a better embryo. All right. I hope I've answered all the questions that I could. I hope everybody found it useful and stay safe everyone enjoy your freedoms if you're not in melbourne and those who are in melbourne hopefully we don't have too long to go until the lockdowns are lifted okay thank you and have a good night